the fifth day of June, 1944, Bill Canahan took a boat ride across the channel to invade France. His job was to drive a tank. He had driven a tank through Africa, over Kazarine Gap into Deserta, had driven it through Sicily and up the Italian boot. And now he was gonna drive it right into Paris and through Paris to Berlin. Yes, Bill was all set to finish the job and finish it quickly. Because like everybody else, he wanted to go home. Like everybody else on that fateful day, he prayed for victory. Hey, Bill, what are you gonna do after you get home? I go back to the family, I guess. Haven't you swallowed enough dust and dirt yet? I did all right in that diet, didn't I? Why should I change when the war's over? What about the heat and the noise? Yeah, they don't bother me. Nothing ever bothered Bill. All he wanted was to win the war and then go home. Look up his old pals in the foundry and brag a little about the things he'd seen and the good job he'd done. Hey, Bill, you think your pals back home are doing a good job? What do you think? I don't know. I hear they're griping a lot and quitting their jobs. Sure, they're griping. We're all griping. But they aren't quitting. Look at all the stuff they're sending us. Look up there. You see those flying forgings? That's what Bill called the fortresses. Flying forgings. He was proud of every piece of casting and forging. He used to tell the other GIs about the finer points of die casting cylinders and drop forging crankshafts. He always said that without the foundries, our armies couldn't move. And he was right. There wouldn't be any planes and trucks and guns. And of course, there wouldn't be any tanks. Without tanks, Bill said, the United Nations couldn't win. That's the way Bill talked until the guns of the naval barrage drowned out his voice. lifted toward dawn, the small landing craft were racing toward the invasion coast. The infantry was going in to establish a beachhead for Bill's tank. Some of the men got killed, but enough got through, through to the hedge-rimmed fields and tree-lined roads. And then came the tanks. Soon, Bill was up in front, shooting his way inland. Before long, he had helped to conquer the first French town. He drove on through the town and across the rich earth of Normandy, the infantry following in the dusty wake of his tank. He drove on to fight his way into Isigny. He chased the enemy out of more villages and towns, always in front, always leading the way. He went on to Carentan. He fought his way into the city and drove through the cheering crowds of Frenchmen who climbed all over his tank. Only 34 more kilometers to Cherbourg. Bill had just passed Saint-Mer-Eglise when it happened. He was going ahead at full speed when a German 88... Bill had taken his last look at France. Bill. Bill? Yeah? Bill, is there anything you'd like to do before you leave this earth? I... I wish I could go home once more. All right. You shall go home. Home to your foundry. Well, Bill, it looks just as you remembered it, doesn't it? The sun pouring through the roof, the sound of the clanging steel, the smell of sand, the fumes rising into the dusty air. It hasn't changed, has it? Same old crane rattling overhead. Same old noise. They're getting ready to pour the steel, and here it goes. The molten steel for armor. All over America, they're casting gray iron and magnesium and aluminum. They're casting and forging. Yes, Bill, this is foundry work as you know it. The sparks flying, the blazing heat, the smoking dies, the sharp clanging of forging hammers. Well, Bill, you ought to remember this spot. You used to wait 
right here for Jack's whistle. That was the signal for you to pour the steel. Turret rings for tanks. Yes, there's an old friend of yours. Frank Nolan, Clem's father. Still checking cores. Hiya, Frank. Clem wanted me to say hello if I got back. He's a swell soldier, and he said if he I can't hear you, Bill. Come along, you still want to see your other pals, don't you? Ziggy and Leo, uh, Leo... Leo Lee. McClinsky, Bill. Yeah, that's right, Ziggy and Leo McClinsky. They're turning out cores just like they used to. And here are Manny Berkowitz and Frank and Ray Shufflery. They're a swell team, always on the job. Look over here, Bill. Watch Nick swinging his grinder. You always liked to watch Nick, didn't you? Yeah, but where are all the others? Where's McAllister? He quit. Quit? Why? Mac was never a quitter. Mac got a chance for a better job, a white-collar job. You don't believe it? Look. Mac. Mac! He can't hear you. Look at these benches. You remember Harry Kleiner? He quit for this. And Al quit for this. Why? They all had their reasons. Mac said it was too hot. Harry couldn't take the dust. With Al, it was the noise. Yes, they all had their reasons. Come, I'll show you something. This is a big new iron foundry. There aren't any men to run it. Charlie can't get the men. You remember Charlie, the personnel manager, don't you? Oh, yeah. Could be a lot better, though. We need men, bad. Production would be way up if we could get them. Sure, there's men, all right. Plenty of them, working in stores and white collar jobs. But they don't want to work in a foundry. It's too tough. You see, they all say the same thing. It's too tough. Even your old friend George feels that way. He's taking the day off. Hello, George. George, why aren't you on the job? They need you back at the foundry. Why'd you stay at home? Are you looking for another job, too? Help wanted mail. So you're gonna quit. <laughs>